Hey guys, it's Shade, and it's time for another Animal Artist Collective video. If you don't already know what the Animal Artist Collective is, it's a group that was started by Denise Soden from In Liquid Color and Jennifer Charlie. The group is meant to bring focus to different animals and we choose a different habitat each time. This time, the habitat is urban animals. And we also have a new member this month, Mary Sanch. And I love her stuff. Her, I love her channel. You guys definitely have to go check her out. She has just absolutely amazing work. And I'm really excited that she is going to be part of the collective. In the Animal Artist Collective, we have our paintings for sale and 50% of the proceeds will go to an animal conservation group. So like I said, this month the theme is urban animals. What do we mean by that? We mean animals that live amongst human beings, which is a pretty cool topic if you ask me because most of the time we have been talking about endangered animals and the way that humans can be detrimental to the well-being of animals. But this time we're going to be talking about animals living amongst humans. Well, in my case, I took this prompt in a little different direction. You know me. And... I'm going to talk about an animal that's flourishing in what was formerly an urban area. So my animal is the marsh fritillary, which is a butterfly. It's a vulnerable butterfly. It's protected in the UK and it's very rare to see it these days, except it has started to make a comeback in a very strange place. This place is called the Green Belt. What is the Green Belt? The Green Belt is a strip of land that basically began as the Iron Curtain. I'm probably going to focus a little bit more specifically on Germany's part of the Green Belt because there is the German Green Belt and there's the European Green Belt. But the project began in Germany because Breling Well basically became a symbol for the Iron Curtain in general. And I used to live in East Germany, now I live in West Germany, and I've been to the Berlin Wall several times. And if you've never been to the Berlin Wall, you might assume that the Berlin Wall is just like a wall like you have in your house. But it's not just a wall. The Berlin Wall is actually like a series of different constructions. So the easiest way to put it is that there are different turrets and there were barbed wire and different places were built slightly differently. But basically you can kind of conceive of it like two big walls with about 60 to 200 meters in between it with nothing there. This was called no man's land. No one was allowed to get near this space from either side of the wall. And on the eastern side, you could lose your life if you tried to approach. That wasn't the case on the western side, but you still weren't allowed to get closer than, I think, 50 meters on the western side. And the wall went straight through people's homes, straight through cities. Sometimes the front part of a family's home would be on one side of the wall and the back part would be on the other side. But all of this had to get abandoned. But people were forced to evacuate, leave entire cities, leave their homes in order to make way for this separation between East and West Germany. This all began in 1961. Now, at some point in time, the Bund für Umwelt und Naturschutz a conservation organization in Germany, which was founded in 1975, noticed something weird after a while. Through their binoculars, they could see rare and vulnerable animals chilling out in the no man's land. 
Eventually, basically what they figured out was that since no one was in this space bothering these animals, the land had gone wild again, which is crazy because this was not a long time. You these apocalyptic movies and they're like, oh, a hundred years into the future, nature has taken over. No, it did not take that long. It took like 30 years and these animals moved in. So on the Western side of the divide, conservators were getting ready, waiting for the day that the wall would come down so that they can swoop in and make sure that this area was protected. So they did really the best that they could and a lot of the area was protected. Unfortunately, a lot of the land which had been reclaimed by these animals, which had not been seen for the longest time, actually was taken back and used as homes and used for agriculture until the mid 90s because obviously people wanted to take this space back it was a lot of space which had been taken away from them homes and things like that it's weird to have just like this gap in the middle of a town or in the middle of a city but conservators wanted to protect this space since it had become so important as a place where these animals that could not survive anywhere else were able to survive. So actually in 2005, Angela Merkel declared the Green Belt part of Germany's national natural heritage, which was an important distinction because it helped to acknowledge that this was an important part of Germany and worth preserving, especially since it goes through nearly all of the major states in Germany. Also in 2002, began the project not just for a German Green Belt, but for a European Green Belt that would span over 12,000 kilometers from the northern part of Europe all the way down to the Black Sea, which is crazy. There would be 107 different habitats in there. It would be the longest biotope in Europe, and it has over a thousand species of endangered animals and plants. And it's important not just because it's big, but because it provides a really, really long stretch of connected biomes, which some of these animals, it's really important, including the marsh fritillary. So even though this is a teensy wincy butterfly, it's literally between one and two inches big. It needs at least 70 hectares of breeding habitat in order to survive. You can understand why this kind of animal would be pretty vulnerable. That's basically the main threat to the marsh fritillary is loss of habitat. That and because they are really picky, tiny butterflies, they only like to live and eat one specific type of plant, which has a pretty funny name. It's called the devil's bit scabious. It's called scabious because it was used to treat scabies and other ailments from the Black Death, and it's called Devil's Bit because apparently the devil was so upset that this plant was so good at curing these things that he bit off the root, and that's why this plant has a very short root system, apparently. <laughs> it's a really pretty plant, and that's the plant that you see me painting in this painting. Just a bit about the painting, and I actually, so I have not only a upper view of the marsh fritillary, I also have a side view. I have a little shaggy caterpillar. The caterpillars are just like these little black balls of fuzz. And I also have the cocoon. So you can see the whole range of the life of this butterfly. So this butterfly is called the marsh fritillary because it likes to live normally in marshes. Makes sense, right? And the fritillary, if you didn't know, fritillary is actually a word which means checkered. So there are many different types of fritillary butterflies, but the marsh fritillary is supposed to be the most ornate of them. And there's also a type of flower which is called a fritillary and it blooms in the springtime. You should check it out. It looks pretty cool, almost like something out of Alice in Wonderland. So probably the most stereotypical place for you to find a marsh fritillary would be in the marshes of England, which makes sense. And, and that's where this 
It's considered an English butterfly, but this butterfly is not only found in England, it is also found in Germany, in the Greenbelt, particularly the Eichfeld area of the Greenbelt, which goes through Thuringia, Lower Saxony, and Hessen. So even though these butterflies are critically vulnerable, they were able to find a place to live in this little piece of land which had been abandoned by humans. And they definitely need to be left alone because they have a particularly long period in which they are larvae, and obviously if they are killed or disturbed during that period, we can't have any more fritillaries. So they start out as eggs. Around 300 to 400 eggs are laid at one time underneath the leaves of the scabiosa. Then they become caterpillars in around June. And there are a ton of them. And they make this huge web. And they eat and feed together for about three weeks. Then by August... Normally they start hibernating and they don't wake up again until it is springtime. Then in the spring, they go into their little cocoons and they become adults by May or June. And after all of that, they only live around two weeks. I'm painting this pretty large. The painting is around A4 size, a little bit bigger than that. And it's kind of funny to look at it at this size, considering how a teensy, weensy the marsh fiddlery actually is. You could fit one on the tip of your finger. But actually, the checkered pattern on this butterfly is quite intense. I'll be honest, this is the first time I have ever painted a butterfly. I mean, I'm sure I painted a really basic, generic monarch butterfly or something when I was in kindergarten. But this is really my first time having a go at butterflies and it was really interesting because it's very bright but actually there's only a few colors. It's just a kind of creamy yellow color, brown, a bit of black and orange. And when we think of butterflies we think of them as so intense and they are intense but it's also a very natural color scheme. And also butterflies are really fuzzy. I don't think about butterflies as fuzzy, or at least the fritillary is very fuzzy. The entire center part of this butterfly is just this big fuzzball. So I just really thought that this story was really uplifting. A lot of times I have some sad stories to tell you during the AAC, and I didn't want it to be so sad this time and this time i am just really excited to hear this story and really excited to see what will happen with the green belt they still need a lot of support and there's still a lot of research to be done it is a huge swatch of land especially if you consider not just the german green belt but the european green belt and I don't really think a lot of people know about it. And even people in Europe, I don't know if a lot of them know about it. And it's just such an important and unique space right here. And I'm also really excited about their plans for the future. They want to look at future opportunities for protecting spaces like these. For example, a bunch of scientists are just waiting for when they can start preserving the demilitarized zone in South Korea, which probably has gone through the same sort of thing that has happened in Germany with the Berlin Wall. And I really just wonder what kind of animals will they find there? How has nature reasserted itself in these spaces that used to belong to people? Sometimes it's easy to think about nature as something very weak, and defenseless but hearing this story is kind of comforting because you know that even after we've messed up everything and even after we're gone slowly but surely things will creep back into the way that they're supposed to be
So I really had a ton of fun painting this painting. I hope that you enjoyed watching it. I hope that you enjoyed learning a little bit about the green belt and the marsh fiddlery. You know, it's animal art collective time. So make sure and go and click on the link to the playlist that I have or click the link to the people in the description below. I'm really excited to see all the videos that everybody has and hear what they have to talk about. What do you think of the March for the Larry? Have you ever seen one? What is your favorite urban animal? Let me know. Tell me in the description. Thank you so much for watching. This painting will be on sale and the link will be in the description below. 50% of the proceeds would go to continuing the exploration of the green belt and preserving the habitat for all of the animals, the over 1,000 endangered species that live there. Hope you guys like this. Thank you so much again for watching. Thank you once again to my Patreons. You make this so awesome. Thank you guys for watching. See you next time. Bye.